And it all began back in 1962. Venus, our nearest planet, was beckoning. Science fiction described a world teeming with life beneath the thick clouds, and many thought there'd be a welcoming party waiting on Venus when our first missions arrived. Back in the 1950s, a lot of people thought that Venus might be a place that looks sort of like this, a, a lush, forested place. There, there were a lot of competing ideas about what Venus might be like in the absence of any information. Remember, all we can see is those clouds looking from Earth, and people wondered what it might be like on the surface underneath those clouds. It was time to head for Venus, and Mariner 2 would lead the way. The Mariner spacecraft, now on its way to Venus, is the most intricate instrument in the history of space science. But the most intricate scientific instrument ever built was proving hard to control. And for the team whose careers depended on the mission, these were nail-biting times. Within a few weeks of launch, Mission Control had lost contact with the spacecraft completely. It was only by luck that contact was regained when the probe located Earth again on its own. Flying to the planets was turning out to be as much a game of chance as one of skill. There was some uh, fingernail biting on the way there, but then of course it flew by on December 14th, 1962 at a distance of 21,000 miles, flew right past Venus and the instruments worked perfectly and it gave us unambiguous evidence of a very, very hot and uh, dry surface uh, on uh, a very alien planet. Venus was a furnace. The Mariner 2 results suggested that this was a very hot atmosphere indeed. But that wasn't all that Venus held in store for future visitors. By 1967, the Russians were ready to attempt a landing on the planet. They were going where no probe had gone before and weren't sure what they'd find. They planned to track their Venera 4 probe as it dropped through the Venusian clouds relaying its findings back home. And the pressure readings were going up and the temperature readings were going up and they hit a level that was about 18 times Earth surface pressure and then the reading stopped. And the Russians assumed that they had hit the ground. But we now know that what happened when the Soviets thought they hit the surface was that their spacecraft had imploded. The Nera 4 was crushed by the air pressures when still 20 kilometers above the surface. It was three more years before the Russians succeeded in reaching the surface. The Nera 7 only managed to transmit a brief signal before it died, but it had revealed what a descent through the Venusian atmosphere would be like. And Space Odyssey used this encounter to create their human descent to the surface of Venus. You'd look out the window, the first thing you'd see is that you'd be descending through thick clouds, but, but not dense clouds. In fact, it'd be more like a fog, infinite fog that went on forever, but not a, not a dense cloud. You'd also go through some layers of extreme turbulence. Systems are good. We know there's some layers with very smooth air and some layers where you'd get buffeted quite a bit, so you, you'd certainly feel that. And then as you descended and made it through the bottom of the clouds, the air is really quite free. Uh, there's a little bit of haze, but there, there's not very much dust or cloud or anything else. So you'd have 30 miles to descend there through, through relatively clear air. Russian perseverance eventually led to eight successful robotic landings on the surface of Venus. Four of them sent back tantalizing images the first vistas from another planet. Fuzzy ones at first, and then on later missions, clearer color views. It remains the most extreme landscape ever to be photographed. There's nowhere on Earth that's really like Venus, but a cloudy desert is a good start. Everything in place, and then we'll move to the Venus site. Okay. Space Odyssey traveled to northern Chile to film their Venus scenes, 
its rolling volcanic terrain and often overcast skies proving just the right look. With the actors suited up and the clouds also cooperating, they're ready to go. And after a bit of post-production to match it to what the Veneers saw, we're standing on Venus. Once you put on your hopefully well-designed suit, you're going to notice that the light is very different from anywhere else you've ever been because again you have those sort of perpetual sunset conditions because the light that filters down through those clouds and through the very thick atmosphere is that sort of diffuse red light. Like the whole day in Moscow down here. Strange flat light everywhere. Orange. Can't tell where the sun is. The air is very, very thick, of course. It wouldn't feel like wading through water. It's not that thick, but it might, you might feel, for instance, the breezes blowing. The breezes are very slight. We're talking a few meters per second. However, in that great thick air, a few meters per second would probably put up enough force that if you were walking against it, you might be wading, feel like you were wading upstream a little bit. This dense atmosphere is made mostly of carbon dioxide, a powerful greenhouse gas that's also responsible for the high temperatures down here too. Such extremes would not be good news for a fragile human frame. On the surface of Venus, you're under you know, 92 atmospheres of pressure compared to that on Earth. So 92 times as much pressure as you are when you're sitting in your front room now. Uh, and you've got, you've got ambient temperatures which will just cook you, pure and simple. And if you're not in your own enclosed habitat, if you're not in, a, in, in your own spacesuit, you're not going to last for more than a few seconds in, 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 in these remote and hostile environments. But it's not only a human that would suffer on the surface of Venus. These extremes take their toll on everything. If the pressure doesn't crush you, there's always the severe temperatures to wear you down. We've got this plate here heated up to roughly Venusian surface temperatures, and uh, let's just see what happens if we drop some lead pellets on the surface here. Although it's pushing 500 degrees centigrade and the Veneers' insides melted after about an hour, their titanium shells remained intact and will still be sitting on the surface today for a future cosmonaut explorer to find. <laughs> Venera 14 carried a sprung arm to measure how fragile the rocks were. Something sort of funny but sort of horrible happened which is that one of the lens caps popped off and wouldn't you know it if it didn't land in exactly the spot where that penetrator was supposed to hit the surface. Venera 14 was the last robot to venture to the surface in the early 1980s. A decade later NASA's Magellan probe returned to Venus and managed to map most of the planet from orbit using radar to see through the clouds. No doubt future robotic missions will return to explore this volcanic surface further and to study the runaway greenhouse which has turned our neighboring planet into a nightmare world. The harsh reality of Venus is that conditions down there on the surface are so extreme the planet wouldn't be first on our list of places to send a person. <laughs> <laughs>